Namaste to all ladies and gentlemen. Feeling so blessed and so very blessed. Of course, these are the memories. Guruji, we were playing a four-minute memory and, and till the time you come back again and again, we use these memories for us to get a little more knowledgeable as much as we can. But uh, uh, we, we are making one more memory today. That's what we are all so keen and so curious to learn from you, to be enlightened from your knowledge and from what you the blessings that you give us. So, Guruji, of course, uh, uh, there is no question of a introduction, but I'll do some part of it, some, some additional data that our guys uh, have found out out of a lot of literature uh, for Guruji's introduction. But uh, today's session, uh, I need to make an announcement because I know a lot of people uh, on the stairs. Is, seminar room number three and five also have this live telecast in case uh, there is no room for people who are standing in, at the back. Two, there's also going, this is also YouTube live. So in case somebody wants to attend this session and they are unable to come here, YouTube live is also there. So once again, namaste and thank you Guruji for coming and blessing us. Uh, Shri M, I'll do the introduction. Naturally, we want to hear him, but uh, is a spiritual guide, social reformer, educationist, author and global speaker. He was born Mumtaz Ali in Thiruvantanpuram in Kerala. At the age of 19, Shri M embarked on a journey to seek a true master. Maheshwarnath Babaji, a senior disciple of Shri Guru Babaji, took Shri M under his tutelage. As instructed by his Guru, Shri M returned to the plans and established the Satsang Foundation more than 20 years ago. The foundation actively conceptualizes, organizes, and executes activities and initiatives in the area of education, health, skill development, environment, and service to mankind. Shri M walked 7,500 kilometers in 2015-16 from Kanyakumari to Kashmir to spread the message of peace and harmony. And all throughout the way, uh, from Kranyakuna, then that's what we were discussing in the boardroom just before a while, that some thousands of people joining him and then other set of people joining him and maybe unique idea, unique people would be some tens of thousands of people also who joined the peace and harmony walk that uh, Guruji took uh, during 15-16. He is the Chancellor of Maulana Azad National Urdu University, a central university and on the faculty of Indian Institute of Technology, New Delhi. Delhi. Shri M was conferred with the Padma Bhushan in January 20 for distinguished services of high order in spirituality. <laughs> and to add to it, uh, we were at the Zen Garden ju just now before we came here in the Kazan Academy. And we said that everything is Japanese style, Japanese design and Guruji also with his sense of humor. Yes, I can see when your air conditions are branded Japanese in the Zen. <laughs> <laughs> so Guruji, once again, thank you so much for coming and blessing us. We look forward to your insightful talk on, on the subject, uh, tapping the infinite potential science of yoga as a token of love. And for the blessings, I will uh, give this memento to Guruji. Guruji, you can... Over to you, sir. I'll, I'll get the microphone. On here? Huh? Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha, Sarve Chantu Niramaya, Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu, Makas Chiddu Kapat Bhavit, Loka Samastha Sukhino. Namaskar to all of you. <coughs> um, I'm going to speak in English. Uh, two reasons. Uh, one is that I can speak in Hindi also, but I see some people who may not follow Hindi. I can see. Probably they have come for the retreat tomorrow. Um, Gujarati, apart from 
કેમ છો અને મજામાં બીકોઝ ઓફ અવર ફ્રેન્ડ્સ ફ્રોમ ગુજરાત એન્ડ કચ લિટલ બીટ આઈ હેવ પિકડ અપ બિયોન્ડ દેટ આઈ ખાન્ટ સ્પીક આઈ અન્ડરસ્ટેન્ડ એવરીથિંગ એન્ડ સિન્સ વી આર હિયર ઇન અમદાવાદ i must uh, i thank you all for the hospitality uh, of the state um i must in the beginning itself thanks to dr savan godiawala who is the president of dr divyesh radia past president mr umesh dikshit executive director um and all our friends jisa kehte hain hamare mitra bhai aur behno ha um thank you for being here and i hope the repetitions don't bore you but sometimes repetitions are necessary which is why mantras are repeated again and again <laughs> hmm? so the subject of uh, today's talk is tapping the infinite potential the science of yoga so there are two uh parts of this which i'm going to bring together one is science of yoga and there is tapping the infinite potential i think we should start first with uh, the science of yoga now <clears throat> yoga many people would like to call it an art but i would say it's a science it's a science which solid proofs available to those who practice but that practice has to be essentially first of all let me tell you i'm very happy to see many young people also here by and by as my satsangs go on this is a satsang it is not a talk i see more and more young people and i'm very happy because even though my hair is gray i also identify with the young so the, so the very well known neurologist is here he will tell you that youth is not the age number but how your mind functions right sir oh, yes so <clears throat> um yoga as a science experimentally it can be proved that yoga has a great effect not only in the of the body but also in the mind but i would like to go back to the traditional aspects of yoga and then come back to the practicals uh yoga is an ancient science unfortunately many people have kind of associated yoga with only physical exercises asanas uh which is good of course and only physical health but according to the writer of the yoga darshana patanjali not patanjali that makes medicines i'm talking about the original patanjali i mean this is interesting once i went to uh in a place called wisconsin in the us and there was a young group of university students practicing yoga and uh, the name of this organization was the perfect knot so first i asked them do you know how to untie the knot they said yes okay fine and then i asked them what yoga do you practice they said ashtanga yoga nice very nice so i said so do you know who is the fo- not so important do you know who is the founder of ashtanga yoga they said yes who they said bk as a yangar <laughs> see so of course bk as a yangar was a great uh, exponent of ashtanga yoga and he took it to the west i mean i fully respect him that's a different story but the founder of uh, yoga was patanjali maharshi and according to patanjali yoga is defined after starting with <clears throat> yoga anushasanam he says yoga chitta vritti nirodha it means yoga is the 
nirodha of the vrittis of the citta did you get it what yoga is the nirodha of the vrittis of the citta to put it in english simple english it means yoga ultimate aim of yoga physical health yes one side because without good physical health it's impossible to have sound mind health understand that good But the aim of yoga is to the vrittis definition of the word vritti is the fluctuations that happen in our mind very often it's high up very often it is very down it never stays tranquil it keeps going up and down i aim for something i get it i'm high up there i aim for something i don't get it i'm down right so these fluctuations which are actually disturbances in the wavelength of the mind well you can also say the brain for our purpose right now are called the vrittis they can be from experiences of this birth i would say from my understanding that they are also part of your past lives if you believe in past life. these are the fluctuations that happen in the mind the disturbances that happen in the mind so the mind waves are always like this these vrittis they may be good vrittis they may be negative vrittis but still they are vrittis so according to patanjali to get the mind free of these vrittis So this is not so simple as just saying away in our day to day life yoga says you have to follow yama niyamas rules and regulations why because if you say i am practicing yoga every day and then in the course of your life if you are only thinking of competition or trying to better somebody else or Uh, being jealous of somebody who is going up and so on then you are actually not practicing yama niyamas it is like saying i am on a sattvic diet why because i am a vegetarian good i understand but a sattvic diet does not mean only vegetarian food the quantity is also important if i <laughs> if i say i am a sattvic i eat only when eat half a kg every day it cannot be sattvic food it becomes rajasic necessary of course for kshatriyas but anyway so as you go into this system you will see that vrittis consist of our daily habits and those which are induced by our daily habits and some of the impressions we have got from childhood and some of the impressions that we carry from the past all these are there now to touch the essence of your being or experience what patanjali calls samadhi what is samadhi means what samadhi the is thought sama when the mind becomes quiet and all thoughts are moving in a proper way which is the tarmac from which one can take off to the higher levels of existence this is essential so yoga basically is how to bring about this stopping of the movement of the vrittis of the mind if this happens through constant practice constant rules and regulations constant you don't have to change your robes you don't have to change your name you don't have to have a special haircut you don't need any of these it is the mind most important is the mind how to keep the mind clear and move forward on this path if this happens then one comes to the definition of yoga given by sri krishna you can say vyasa if you like in the bhagavad gita 
where when Arjuna asks him a question, who do you think is the greatest among yogis? Or who do you think is the greatest among bhaktas? Because it comes in the 12th chapter, which is titled Bhakti Yoga. Krishna says there are different modes of worshipping the divine. The rishis worship them, the divine as the supreme, all pervasive Brahman and so on. Others worship the supreme as me, like with form, name and form. But it doesn't matter what the modus operandi or the system is. Qualities are important. If these three qualities are there in a human being, according to Krishna, then I would consider that person as a great yogi. So what are the qualities? The first one is Samniyam Indriya Gramam. One who has control over his senses. This is very important to note. Nobody is saying you should not indulge in your senses. Many yogis have been grahasthas. Not all yogis are sannyasins. Control of the senses means don't allow your senses to run away with your mind. Rather keep them under check with your mind. Use when necessary, withdraw when necessary. This Samniyam Indriya Gramam, one who has complete control over, not complete control over all the Indriyas. Um, second quality is what we discussed just now. Sarvatra Sama Buddhaya. Which means that the mind remains tranquil in the midst of all circumstances. You cannot always change circumstances. Some circumstances you can change, some you cannot. For instance, you have no control over somebody getting angry with you. I can say I won't get angry, but I have no control over the other person. So these things happen. Things change. Reactions are different. In the midst of all this, it is, is it possible to keep your mind tranquil? Now you must understand that the Gita is preached in the battlefield, Kurukshetra, not in a cave or a monastery. So it's a very practical, in the midst of the activities of daily life. Can I keep my mind tranquil? This is where yoga comes into the picture, which is why Patanjali calls yoga, defines yoga as yoga's chitta vritti nirodha. The capacity to keep the mind's waves uniform and not going up and down all the time. Now, I also mentioned Ashtanga Yoga. Now, why is yoga called Ashtanga Yoga? Yoga is called Ashtanga Yoga because it has eight angas, eight limbs, eight branches. Nowhere in the Yoga Sutra does Patanjali call it Ashtanga Yoga, although it has eight angas. Patanjali calls it Kriya Yoga. The first chapter of uh, Adhyaya of Patanjali's Yoga Sutra talks about the state where you reach ultimately, Samadhi Pada. The second one is called Sadhana Pada. What are the practices required? Which is where the Ashtangas come. Now in that, <clears throat> Patanjali refers to the eight Angas which will lead you towards the perfection in yoga. Now, while doing that, he also discusses and defines yoga. The first sentence of the chapter called Sadhana Pada, Patanjali's, is uh, Tapas, Swadhyaya, Ishara Pranidhanani, Kriya Yoga. So tomorrow there is a workshop on Kriya Yoga. Now don't think that Kriya Yoga is something special. Um, of course, when I say Kriya Yoga, I refer to that Kriya which has come from Sri Guru Bhavati. Okay. But 
Patanjali himself calls yoga as a whole as kriya, which means practice. Nairantariya bhyasena, another word used very frequently the Yoga Sutras. Because what we are trying to do is because we live in different circumstances, different households, different environments, our minds are likely to be looking at things differently. So therefore, to bring those thoughts into a particular mode, you need practice. Very important. And satsanga. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is not a book on yoga, of course, this way, there's a beautiful statement which says that all human beings are society-oriented. Nobody can live in isolation. And therefore, if you don't have sadhu satsanga, which means company of spiritually inclined people, since you cannot live alone, you will fall into dursanga. Right? Because a human being develops according to the environment. So if you don't have satsanga, normally you will go into dursanga. So therefore, Satsanga is part of Yamaniyamas, which means to be familiar, Swadhyaya, to be familiar with the texts that describe yoga. To tapas, which means the word tapas is derived from the word tapa, which means heat. How does heat happen? You generate heat when you're fighting against tendencies. This is called tapas. It need not... Those days of tapasya, where Dhruva stood on one foot for a long time, in Kali Yuga it's impossible. Here when we say tapas, it means effort given to change your habits, which generates heat. This is called tapasya, internal heat. And if you are a practitioner of yoga, also external heat in your body. So, then this is called Kriya Yoga. Okay. Now the Bhagavad Gita has 18 chapters. Each one is called a yoga. So yoga cannot be just Abhyasa Yoga. Simple. Can yoga be just standing on your head? Which is good for health. I have been doing it from the age of 10. I haven't had any nervous breakdown or hemorrhage of my brain. Nothing has happened, if you know how to do it, right? So, so what did I say? <laughs> no, no, not about that. Then you watch out here. Right, so we are listening. Okay, good. <laughs> Aviya satsang bana. So, um, in the Bhagavad Gita, there are 18 chapters and each chapter is called a yoga. Just watch. Listen, please remember this. So, it cannot be only Abhyasa Yoga. Other things are included, starting with Arjuna Vishada Yoga. Now, this Arjuna Vishada Yoga, people try to skip. But it is the most important beginning of the Bhagavad Gita because it is the yoga of Arjuna's, uh, what shall we say, sadness, unhappiness, insecurity, uncertainty. Sanskrit Vishada can be translated in many ways. English doesn't have enough words to translate Vishada. Now, this is common to all human beings. At some point or the other, we are in Vishala. Right? So that is the beginning, the point where one begins to think that, well, I did everything, I made so much, and then something happens which says, life is so hollow, what am I to do now? I know I meet hundreds of people. Believe me, many of them are so well padded with money that they can even sleep on it. Not happy. <laughs> and it can happen to the rich or the poor, to anybody, this Vishada. Suppose I'm expecting a promotion. It comes to somebody who I think is not qualified. What happens to me? 
five days i don't eat i go home i'm angry with my wife no, i don't i'm just say uh, <laughs> i have no competition anyway so um this is called vishada every human being goes through it at some point or the other in fact when your child is born buddha once asked somebody have you heard of a child that is born laughing every child begins his life with you know what ha ah, crying <laughs> so that means there is some indication we are going to face this world <laughs> right but then we give lollipops and make them forget it but good thing some lollipops are good mm. so anyway then slowly one begins to understand this and how to free oneself from this so we are coming to the second part which is the infinite potential in yoga just now i'm giving you a general glimpse of yoga please remember but before we go forward the bhagavad gita one of the important chapters is also bhakti yoga chapter 12 right so yoga is not all like in fact recently i published a book which is meant for those who don't believe in god it's called yoga also for the godless also don't forget the also that doesn't mean it's not for those who believe in god so it is actually a translation word by word shloka by shloka of the yoga sutras of patanjali <clears throat> so let's come to this 12th chapter and then go to the next part of the infinite potential um i don't have to discuss more about this kind of yoga because most of you must be doing some yoga or the other right so um before that among the ashtangas one important anga which people don't give much attention is called pratyahara 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 is usually translated as withdrawal of the senses i don't think that is the right word for pratyahara pratyahara means the capacity to fix your attention on one thing at one time and also learn how to take it stop it and fix it on something else this only a yogi can do when a yogi is driving he is not meditating anyway even non yogi shouldn't meditate when you're driving and when he is meditating he is not thinking about who is going to steal his car this is a yogi one thing at a time with complete attention this is pratyahara now since we went to the zen garden just now here beautiful garden they have made here i want to tell you a little zen uh, story i don't know if you are aware that this great thing called zen which everybody is interested in many people are interested in also people who don't want to talk about um, don't want to accept that we have wisdom here like to take wisdom from japan i mean i'm not saying we I'm in general so zen becomes very important mm-hmm. Uh, if you say it is the same thing in the hindu system who cares zen okay why is imported from japan like our air conditioners hitachi and so on toyota okay good i'm not saying anything against that so now what i'm saying is that even the word zen that appears in all over the world now so famous um uh, and we love it you know it's in my native state in kerala we have a saying muttatte mullekke manam illa that means for the jasmine that grows in your own garden doesn't smell good other garden smells nice <laughs> so anyway but there are very good points in zen i am not now what i wanted to tell you is this zen is actually an indian product that has gone to japan even if it was a japanese for no harm but i am saying it's a fact how bodhi dharma the founder of zen i mean not zen 
Bodhidharma was a South Indian monk who went from Tanjaur, Tanjore. There are big temples even today. Um, that's why I say there's a lot of hope in Tamil Nadu. There's so many. If you put together all the temples in India, you will find same number of temples in one place in Tamil Nadu. Tanjaur Kumbakonam. The great Chidambara temple is also there. Anyway, so <laughs> Bodhidharma went from there. He is also responsible for taking the science of Kung Fu there. Because he went from a land where they practiced a certain uh, unarmed, uh, unarmed combat called Kalari, which of course in Kerala, also in some parts of Tamil Nadu. He was from Tamil Nadu. I don't know if you have seen Bodhidharma's paintings because nobody had photographs then. A big man with a big mustache and so on. So Bodhidharma became a Buddhist monk and he taught a particular brand of uh, Buddhism, which he called Dhyana Buddhism. Now, he traveled in those days to China. And when he went to China and introduced Dhyana, because of the Chinese language, Dhyan became Chan. And then, when it was imported into Japan, Chan became Zen because of the guttural language. So, it's not as if it's really foreign. Quite part of our culture. They adapted it according to circumstances. So also, the Shaolin monks who practiced Self-defense, you must have seen some movies on YouTube. Shaolin monks flying from, all started with Bodhidharma. <clears throat> uh, why did I say it? In reference to Pratyahara. There is a story that uh, Bodhidharma in China was living on top of a mountain when two young people who wanted to learn Zen climbed up the mountain. With Those days there were no Google Maps, no Google Pins, uh, and Bodhidharma did not have banners, no YouTube. Hmm. So they found somehow many days of wandering, they came across Bodhidharma. They climbed up, they went up to him, and they prostrated. And that time, Bodhidharma, was drinking his soup, which was his lunch. So they went and said, Sir, we have come from far with great difficulty, this, that, and so on. Bodhidharma was kind. Please teach us Zen. Teach us how to attain Satori. Satori is Samadhi, let's say, in Zen. Bodhidharma, without looking at them, said, I am drinking my soup. So again they asked him, same reply, they got very agitated. Said, we came for something so great. This man is saying, I am drinking my soup. So what is this? Third time they asked, he called somebody and said, give them their soup. So they also ended up. So while drinking soup, they said, no, this is silly. We came for Zen and we got soup. So when he again said, I am drinking my soup. They said, Sir, we are also drinking our soup. And Bodhidharma turned. By the time his lunch was over, put to bed. he said, No, you are not drinking your soup. You are drinking your soup and thinking of Zen. I am drinking my soup. I am drinking my soup. I am drinking. This is Zen. You know what I mean? That Pratyahar, where you are fully there, and not anywhere else. Believe me, people in all fields, not only religious, yogic and mystic, who are good at the, their craft, art or science, are all practitioners of Pratyahara. When you paint, do you think of anything else? 
No. <laughs> You're there. So, I wanted to just connect Zen garden with Pratyahara. That's why I brought in this story. Now, coming to the second part, which is infinite potential in yoga. Now, this infinite potential can be tapped in your material life as well as in your spiritual life. Now, there's an ancient sloka from the Upanishad. You must have heard it many times. Unfortunately, since Sanskrit is at a premium, you might have heard, you might have chanted. I'm reminded there is a last part of the Ishavash Upanishad, which talks about what is to be chanted when a person is dying. The other day I was discussing with somebody. I said, now this is of no use because the dying person nowadays cannot understand Sanskrit. So either you teach him Sanskrit or translate it. Masmantam Shariram. Anyway, so this is why I'm trying my best wherever I go. I keep telling people, please introduce Sanskrit as a subject in universities. Because it is the root language of this country and this great culture which has spread all over the globe almost. If I don't know Sanskrit, what will others know? It's very important to learn. Also, nobody can then misinterpret and lead you astray. You know what you're doing. You know, the whole concept of special people coming for worship and puja came about because our people forgot how to do their own homas, <clears throat> which they used to do every day at home as nitya karmas. We forgot, so professionals have to come. In Tamil Nadu, they say, Vadiyar is coming. Hmm? So, Sanskrit, therefore, is... So, anyway, the sloka is... You must have heard it many times. Om, Purnamada, Purnamidam, Purnat, Purnamaduchyate, Purnasya, Purnamataya, Purnameva, Vashishyate. Note. The Upanishad says, Purnamada, that is Purna, which means what? The origin of everything, from where this whole universe has come, through differentiations of frequencies, from one frequency, that is by itself Purna, the source. That we may agree, okay, maybe, but maybe Purna, we don't know. The second sentence you'll argue, because Purnamidam says this is also Purna, but we always find that we are not Purna. We are incomplete. The whole of evolution, the process of life is incompleteness, trying to complete itself. I'm this, I want to become that. I have one car, but not enough, I need three. For some time, I was Purna, my mind, when I got myself a nice Toyota. Then, next day, after three months, I found a neighbor has got a Rolls Royce. Purna is finished. <laughs> Becomes a Purna. Not complete. This is life. I always want to complete it. Why? So deep down, the mind or the brain knows that its origin is Purna. If even this little bit, if you understand, then Purnamidam, Purnat, Purnamaduchyate, from that Purna came this Purna. Purnasya, Purnamataya, Purnameva, Vashishyate. Although this has come from that, that Purna remains Purna forever. It doesn't diminish. Now, there is no way you can explain this sloka except Einstein. That energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It's constant, Purna. You see that it is. it looks incomplete, but in truth, it is complete. Now, if one can think about it even in the mind, 
that we are inheritors of Purnata, of the supreme all-pervading being, which is power, energy, goodness, everything put together, then our potential becomes infinite. We no longer are limited. We see that there is an infinite potential in the origin of the universe, which is also our origin. Therefore, you break through all the limitations. And then it reflects in life. In my case, for instance, and specifically, I was born in a certain setup, in a certain state, where everybody sees red all the time. Mostly, I mean, there are other. And in a circumstance, in a family, which has no idea about Vedanta. Right? So if you ask me, I was quite handicapped when I started in my spiritual life. Then, what happened? I was still thinking maybe in this life, I may not be able to reach the heights of the whole teaching of Purnata. Then this great teacher called Maheshwar Babaji came and put his hand on my head. The whole perspective changed. He said, as a human being, you are the essence of Purnata. So don't think of any limitations. Cut through all limitations. Move forward and touch that which I want you to touch. Don't know, maybe I have, maybe I'm not, but I certainly think I've broken free of many constraints and uh, conditionings and made myself, uh, it's not made myself free, rather as you open up the constraints and restrictions, that which is your original self, which is Purna, reveals itself. I also believe all the great scientists, all the great achievers in any field have come there by understanding that they have to break through the restrictions. And this also for the young. Don't say, I cannot do this. You can. You may fail ten times, but when you fail ten times, remember that Thomas Alva Edison, Edison, who invented the electric bulb. Today we don't know the value, we switch it and it's on. Failed 99 times, 100th time he invented the electric bulb. Right? So this is especially a message for the young. Break free from your limitations and restrictions. Open up your mind because in origin you are Purna. Purna Madha, Purna Midam. In small things you can see this happen, but take it into your heart and say, in the essence of my being, there is Purnata. So, therefore I am breaking all these restrictions and moving towards it. If you are already retired and not part of the daily life routine, this is the best time also to do that, because then you go into the spiritual Purnata, material Purnata, spiritual Purnata then you can, you have time. And this time, please utilize to touch your essence, where you come from. Purnamada. If this, even this thought is generated in the mind, you have tapped infinite potential in you, in each one of us. Because in each one of us, this is my also Anubhava, that in every human Hridaya, when I say Hridaya, it's not exactly the physical organ that pumps blood. The core of my being, as you call in English, the heart of the matter, the core of my being. There is a spiritual essence, which is a spark of the divine. It's there in everybody. It cannot discriminate. It's in everybody. If that is not there, we won't breathe, talk, think. And if it is there, then all of us are moving temples of God. And how will you worship that? Through Seva. 
So, like Swami Vivekananda said, he took it from, of course, from the Upanishad. Atmano Moksharta Jagat Hitaecha. Do what you can for the world. Put things in order. And look into the heart for moksha. And moksha is what? Discovering that you are not an incomplete, stupid little being, but part of the infinite whole, which is called Purnata, the Parabrahman. This is the essence of the teachings of Vedanta and the potential that you could get through yoga. Before I wind up this particular talk, I must say, please also understand that yoga not only deals with your muscles and your body and your bones, it also deals with your endocrine glands. The endocrine glands play a great part in altering your moods. Like for instance, if I say, I'm meditating, I'm in a very happy mood, which means your blood is now given a concentrated dose of serotonin. Therefore, I feel good. So happiness is again somewhat chemical. Now, what yoga has done, they have developed techniques on how to physically change this. When you want, if you are depressed, there are methods in yoga by which you can increase serotonin. Breathing techniques and so on and so on. I'm talking about ordinary yoga, not, not the yoga beyond asanas. Ordinary. Even that is important. For instance, if you are constantly getting angry, First of all, if you if this is happening, you should check yourself. There may be something wrong, high BP or whatever. But then you decide, I don't want to get angry because, you know, anger is a kind of madness. You do things which you afterwards regret for. Maybe you can function better without getting angry. But first you have to decide, I don't want this anger, I can do without it. First, mental decision. Second, as soon as anger arises, nip it in the bud before it spreads. Not easy. However, the chemical doctor will tell you that the chemical analysis shows that when you're angry, your heartbeat increases. So it's also not healthy for you to be angry. And why? Because a large percentage of... Uh, mm -hmm. Adrenaline is pumped into the system. We don't know whether anger causes adrenaline or adrenaline causes anger, but both happen together. Now, if you say, I have decided I'm, I will not get angry, but anger comes, how do I handle it? I'm telling you there are specific yogic processes by which the adrenaline can be adjusted. And it's very simple. There's something called Matsyasana. I don't want somebody to demonstrate, but if you do Matsyasana constantly, it massages this part of your body structure where the adrenal glands are and very slowly you get soothened down. And if you practice it for many years, I'm sure you can kind of adjust to this anger. First you have to decide, I don't want to get angry. Not otherwise, there's no point. Okay. Now, the thing is, very soon people discover that you won't get angry, so they do whatever they want. Happens to me. So, sometimes in this world you have to pretend to be angry, but you don't have to actually be angry. Uh, from the life of Ramakrishna Pramahamsa, there's a story. Sri Ramakrishna used to have teachings in little parables, which are so nice. He said, once upon a time, they used to live a very dangerous cobra in a small street in the village. So a brahmachari came there, wandering Parivrajaka. And then he saw the uh, that nobody was going on the street. So he said, "What? why are you nobody going there? They said, there's a very dangerous cobra there. 
So don't go. You might be killed. He said, no, no, I know how to handle this. So he went and whatever he had to do, he did. And the uh, cobra came out. So the brahmachari said, why are you living a life like this? Everybody is afraid of you. Be good. Be peaceful. Uh, cobra said, okay, but will you teach me how to get this power that you have by which even I cannot bite you? So the brahmachari said, yes, I can, but there is one condition. What is that? I'll teach you a mantra, but from now you should decide that I will not bite anybody. Cobra said, okay, fine, it's worth it. He took the mantra from him and went back. Two years later, the brahmachari came. Children were playing marbles in the street. So he went and said, what happened to that cobra? Oh, that one. He is inside the hole. We have broken his backbone. I said, how? Because we came to know that he stopped biting. <laughs> so we have broken his ribs. So the brahmachari went there and called him by name. He said, yes, master, I am here. So why are you there? He said, because I can't move. My spine has been broken. I stopped biting on your advice, but I'm quite happy. So the brahmachari said, fool, I told you not to bite. Did I ask you not to hiss? <laughs> mm -hmm. So in this world, sometimes it's necessary to hiss. You need not bite. You know what I mean. So, uh, we live in this practical world. So, if you live in this practical world and still understand the essence of yoga, that deep down your potential is unlimited, both here and beyond, then <clears throat> you will be happy and the world you live in will become Sarve Bhavantu Suginaha. May the whole world be happy. Loka Samasta Sukino Bhavantu. This is an ancient thing, maybe 5,000 years before, has been said by the Rishis. And to the youngsters, I have, before I wind up this, um, an appeal. Please don't get carried away by people who say that all civilization and culture has come from the West. In this country, there are diamonds hidden, there are treasures hidden. Explore. And to explore that, you need to attend satsangs. And if possible, try and study a little bit of Sanskrit so that you can go to the originals. Hmm? And if this happens, we will tomorrow be torch holders for the future of this world. People keep saying, Vishwa Guru, Vishwa Guru. We need to be, we aren't. We were at one time, maybe. Not maybe, yes, but now we need to work towards it. So to be a good Guru, you need to be a good disciple, right? So get into that mode and tap your potential to infinite Energy, infinite. Goodness, infinite. Power. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Thank you. <laughs> now, there is supposed to be a question answer, sir. No. You can come here. Sir, aap idhar aajaye. Here is a our good friend, who many years ago got me on to an interview, and just as I was entering, he said, Hindi mein bolenge aap. <laughs> so I did it. Mane hiya avtaj, salu kobra yaad avi ho. Emne kidu che ke batku parwani na paadi je, pan pofala to kari shakar. Media no maalas su, એટલે સવાલ પૂછવા છે હિન્દી હા હા હિન્દી મેં સવાલ પૂછના ચાહુંગા ઓર ખાસ કરકે એસે સવાલ જો મેરી હિસાબ સે બહોત લોગ જો જાનના ચાહતે 
आपसे स्पिरिचुअल वर्ल्ड में देर आर सो मेनी ऑप्शन मिस्टर ए मिस्टर बी मिस वाई मिसिज जेड आई थिंक मेरे हिसाब से स्पिरिचुअल वर्ल्ड में आने वाले लोगों के सामने कंफ्यूजन बहुत है सो हाउ दे सिलेक्ट किस रास्ते से जाना किसको फॉलो करना है मैं आपको अभी हिंदी में बोलेंगे हिंदी में प्रश्न है जी 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 तो इतना कहना चाहूँगा कि हमारे यहाँ एक बहुत पुराना उपनिषद है जिसका नाम है कठो उपनिषद कठो उपनिषद में नचिकेत आठ साल का लड़का है जो यमलोक जाता है वो क्या होता है कि उपनिषद में उनके पिता बहुत वो भी ऋषि थे और वो विश्व जित का यज्ञ किया मतलब विश्व को जीतने के लिए और जो ब्राह्मण आए थे वो होम करने के लिए यज्ञ करने के लिए जब यज्ञ खत्म हुआ जब वो जा रहे थे उन्होंने उनको गिफ्ट्स दिए तो नचिकेत आठ साल का था वो देख रहा था ये कैसा यज्ञ है क्या सैक्रिफाइस है कि मेरे पिताजी जो यज्ञ करने आए थे उनको ऐसे गाय दे रहे हैं जो लंगड़े हैं जो अंधे हैं जिसमें दूध नहीं आ रहा है ऐसे दे रहे हैं ये क्या है तो उन्होंने दो तीन बार बच्चा ने पिताजी को पूछा कि ये कैसा सैक्रिफाइस है और फिर पूछा कि आपका सबसे आप सबसे प्यार करते हैं मुझसे मैं आपका अकेला लग अगर ये यज्ञ हो तो मुझे आप किसको देंगे तो ऋषि ने थोड़ा सा गुस्से में कह दिया कि मैं तुमको यम यम राजा के वहां दे दूंगा मौत दे दूंगा तो ऋषि थे इसलिए उनका जो वाक्य था वो सच निकला और वो यम लोग में पहुंच गए अब यम लोग में गए तो ये सडन बात थी तो यम राजा दूसरे कोई आत्मा को लेने गए थे तो नचिकेत को तीन दिन यमदेव के ऑफिस में बैठना पड़ा एक कठोपनिषद तो यमदेव वापस आए देखे कि इतना मुख पर इतना शाइनिंग है एक ब्रह्मचारी बैठा हुआ है तीन दिन से और अतिथि देवो भवा बहुत बड़ा स्टेटमेंट है तो वो हाथ जोड़ के कहे कि मैं माफी चाहता हूँ क्योंकि तुम तीन दिन यहाँ बैठे हो मैंने नहीं पूछा कि पानी पिया खाना खाया कुछ नहीं पूछा तो इसलिए मुझे कॉम्पनसेशन तीन वर पूछो मैं देने के लिए तैयार हूँ तो उन्होंने पहला वर जैसा बच्चा था तो उसने कहा जब मैं वापस जाऊंगा तो मेरे पिताजी मुझे रिकग्नाइज करके ना मेरा गुस्सा कम हो जाएगा उनका और मुझे प्यार से वापस वेलकम करेंगे ये मेरा पहला वर यमदेव कहा तो ठीक है हो गया दूसरा स्वर्ग क्या है और स्वर्ग में जाने का तरीका क्या है वो भी मैं दे देता तीसरा उन्होंने पूछा कि कई लोग कहते हैं कि शरीर मर जाता है तो आत्मा नहीं होता है क्लॉक वर्क जैसा बन हो जाता है और कोई कहते हैं कि नहीं आत्मा होता है वो सरवाइव करता है शरीर मुझे ये बताइए कि ऐसी कोई चीज है क्या हमारे में मतलब मनुष्य में जो शरीर के बाद सरवाइव करता है अगर है तो जरूर वो पैदा वाले पैदा होने वाली चीज नहीं हो सकती है जो भी पैदा होता है वो मर जाता है तो ऐसी कोई चीज है क्या जो अमृत है हमारे अंदर ये समझाइए यमदेव उनको कहा कि देखो ये बड़ी मुश्किल की बात है इसका उत्तर आपने पूछा ना इसलिए मैं क्या ये बहुत इसका उत्तर बहुत मुश्किल की बात है ऋषि लोग भी कभी कभी नहीं जानते हैं देव लोग में भी इनका इसका पता नहीं है किसी को तो ये काम करो तीनों लोक का राजा मैं तुमको बनाता हूं जो पूछे देता हूं कुबेर जैसा पैसा तुम्हारे पास आ जाएगा और तुम्हारे चारों तरफ अफसरों को लाकर डांस करवाऊंगा हाथी दे सकता हूं बैंड दे सकता हूं सब दे सकता मगर ये मत पूछो 
तो ये हम तो नचिकेत ने कहा अगर ये इतना इम्पोर्टेंट है तो मैं यही चाहता हूँ दूसरा कुछ नहीं आपका जो डांसिंग गर्ल्स और हाथी है वो आपके पास ही रखी है वो मुझे नहीं चाहिए ऐसा स्टूडेंट आएगा ना तो ऐसा गुरु भी मिलेगा हाँ वो क्या है क्या है सर वो अगर आप मेरे पास आए और बोले कि देखिए मुझे आध्यात्मिक वो है समाधि अनुभव करना है परमात्मा से अनुभव होना है मुझे और मैं आपको कहूँगा भैया ये सब बड़ी मुश्किल की बात है तो मैं काम करो एक मर्सिडीज खड़ी है गैराज में चाबी लेके जाओ <laughs> कितने लोग होंगे बोलेंगे नहीं 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 मुझे वो आत्मा मोक्ष चाहिए नहीं होगा ना तो अगर वो ऐसा कोई बोल रहा है तो दूसरों को भी कंफ्यूज करेगा ये बात है बहुत अच्छा बहुत अच्छा बहुत क्लियर हो गया मेरे हिसाब से योगा का जब भी बात निकलती है योगा की और मुझे भी यहीं से ये सवाल भी दिया गया जिनको पता चला कि मैं आपसे कुछ बात करने वाला हूं तो मुझे खास पूछा गया कि योगा के बारे में जब भी डिस्कस होता है सब लोग चाहते हैं कि हम योगा करें वक्त के लिए क्योंकि ये बहुत कॉमन मैन लेमन का क्वेश्चन है कि योगा का वक्त कौन सा होना चाहिए कोई कहता है कि ब्रह्म मुहूर्त में करिए कोई कहता है कि तो सही में सही मायने में क्या एक दो चीज है इसमें योग अगर करना है तो डेली करना एक मैं बाद में आऊंगा उसके बाद रेगुलरली प्रैक्टिस करना निरंतर यह अभ्यास है ना पतंजलि का स्टेटमेंट है तो रेगुलरली एक टाइम फिक्स करके उस टाइम पे करना है अब हर आदमी वो ब्रह्म मुहूर्त में कर भी नहीं सकता कैसे करेंगे बोलिए साढ़े तीन बजे उठ के आप योग करेंगे हाँ ब्रह्म मुहूर्त है तो ऑफिस जाओगे कार चला के तो कहीं एक्सीडेंट हो जाएगा नींद आ जाएगी है कि नहीं प्रैक्टिकली क्या तो ऐसा समय बनाइए सुबह में जब बाकी एक्टिविटीज ज्यादा शुरू नहीं हुए हैं अब उस समय मत बोलिए मुझे कुत्ते को वॉकिंग लेके जाना है उसको बदलना पड़ेगा थोड़ा क्योंकि लाइफ चेंज होने जा रहा है ऐसे तो कुत्ते को हम लेके नहीं जाते हैं कुत्ता हमें लेके जाता है <laughs> <laughs> तो वो उसका टाइम थोड़ा बदलाना पड़ेगा सीरियसली hmm. करना पड़ेगा और ऐसा टाइम मॉर्निंग अच्छा है जब बाकी थॉट्स पूरे नहीं आए हैं अच्छा है खुला है तो उस टाइम पे अगर आपको टेनिस खेलना है तो शाम को कर लीजिए हाँ तो इसके लिए इसका सीरियसनेस समझ के एक टाइम बनाना है बेटर इन द मॉर्निंग और इन द इवनिंग इवनिंग भी अच्छा है क्योंकि अगर आप कहेंगे कि साढ़े छः बजे मैं सब एक्टिविटीज खत्म करके मैं फिर योग करूंगा बहुत अच्छा है क्यों फिर बार की घंटी बजेगी तो आने जाओगे योगा करेंगे ना तो ऐसा टाइम ढूंढ के निकालना है शाम को या सुबह में एक इम्पॉर्टेंट चीज़ है कि जब पेट के अंदर बहुत खाना है अगर भरा हुआ है तब योगा नहीं करना है तो एम स्टमक में करना सबसे अच्छा तो मैं कहूँगा कि मॉर्निंग प्रेफरेबल है मगर इसका मतलब नहीं है कि आप ब्रह्म मुहूर्त में जाके अगर हो सकता है तो कीजिए मगर सारे दिन लाइफ में सफ़र नहीं करना है इसलिए योगा हम कर रहे हैं अच्छे होने के लिए उसके बीच में फिर सफरिंग क्यों लाना है जी थैंक यू सो मच मुझे लगता है कि बहुत सारा मतलब डाउट से करीबन आठ दस पंद्रह लोगों का ये सवाल था खास करके आपने यूथ को अपील किया चुनाव का वक्त है और अट्ठाईस साल से इस इंडस्ट्री में हूं तो थोड़ा वो सवाल तो आ ही जाएगा लेकिन वो वाला सवाल नहीं है एक ऐसा सवाल जो आप जैसे ज्ञानी अनुभवी विद्वान लोगों के पास जानना मार्गदर्शन लेना जरूरी है हिंदुस्तान में आजादी के बाद पहली बार शायद देखा गया है कि राष्ट्र प्रेम और धर्म प्रेम ये दोनों एक साथ पिक पर अभी चल रहे हैं। मेरे हिसाब से अलग अलग टाइम पे इस देश ने धर्म प्रेम को पिक होते हुए देखा और कई बार राष्ट्र प्रेम को तो इस 
समय को इस एरा को किस तरह से देखते क्योंकि आप पास्ट याद कर सकते तो फ्यूचर में भी कुछ और ये मेरा अंतिम सवाल है इस देश में ये दोनों एक साथ पिक चल रहा है फ्यूचर क्या देख रहे हैं मैं इतना कहना चाहूंगा कि अगर पॉलिटिक्स को क्या बोलते हैं राजनीति में धर्म का इन्फ्लुएंस नहीं होगा तो राजनीति एकदम आर्टिफिशियल वेस्टर्न हो जाएगी तो बड़ी जरूरी है कि अपना धर्म जो है उसका इफेक्ट राजनीति में होना चाहिए ऐसा नहीं है कि लोगों को पकड़ के कन्वर्ट करें ऐसा नहीं है वो तो हमने देख लिया ऐसा कुछ होता नहीं मगर जो भी राजनीति में हैं उनके हृदय में हमारे धर्म के बारे में पूरा इंटरेस्ट रहना चाहिए मुझे लगता है कि एक हिसाब से हो रहा है मगर अभी हुआ नहीं है होने वाला है तो एक दूसरा एक गाना है पता नहीं बहुत लोग क्यों जानते हैं अपने जन्म भूमि जो है वो बड़ी इंपॉर्टेंट चीज है अब हमारा भारत जो है ये ऐसी जन्म भूमि है जहां हम पैदा हुए हैं जहाँ धर्म के बारे में अल्टीमेट ज्ञान हुआ है तो इसको जो नेगलेक्ट करता है वो अपने मातृभूमि को नेगलेक्ट करने से आगे नहीं बढ़ सकता बहुत अच्छा क्योंकि ये हमारी गुरु है वो गाना है बहुत लोग नहीं जानते होंगे कम लोग जानते होंगे नमस्ते सदा वत्सले मातृभूमि सुखम वर्जित हो तो इसको मन में लग के आगे चलना है और मुझे लगता है कि आजकल यंगस्टर्स को इसके बारे में थोड़ा कुछ समझ में आ गया है तो ठीक रास्ते से ही जा रहे बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद थैंक यू सो मच Some other time. Sorry. Yes. As Guruji said, yes, there are a lot of questions, but we have to adhere to the time. This is the culture of the institution, and we respect. It's not only our time; it's everybody's time. No disrespect so, to you. Yes, absolutely no disrespect. And Guruji will be here. in case in the end you know those some people want to sign something but please be in a queue because that is also very important let's not rush up uh respected guruji shri m my colleagues members of ama invited guests ladies and gentlemen i'm sure you'll agree it's been a wonderful evening scintillating scintillating so to say and very grateful to shri m for this energizing and enriching satsang as he put it in his own words it was truly a satsang and where he explained this topic you know tapping the infinite potential the science of yoga in a very i will say a very simple and a lucid style where we could he broke it up into such a simple language that we all understood it and understood in such a way i am sure that we can implement it to really reach our infinite potential each one of us can do it that is what he said in very very simple words so we are grateful to you for accepting our invitation to once again come here he has been here three times before and i remember recalling when he was here before his you know this long yatra i think 2015 he was here and we saw the glimpses of that talk also um <coughs> and Uh, friends and thankful to guruji once again and to the members of the press and the electronic media and all of you for the overwhelming response this hall is full and there are others in the hall and some people online and especially to the youngsters we are so happy that the youngsters are there and they have asked questions that he has also given a very strong and a simple message to the youngsters so i don't want to waste time and once again thank you thank you guruji and thank you once again have a wonderful weekend namaste
teams. They can come from there. Yeah. Do you do something? Absolutely.